الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد today in tarawih we recited surah al imran surah al imran is the third surah of the quran one of the longest surahs and it is again like surah al baqarah of the madani period obviously the surah being this long contains so many different topics but the main two themes of the surah are the battle of uhud in the third year of hijra and the people of the book first of all the people of the book allah subhanahu wa ta'ala both in the beginning of the surah the middle as well as the end speaks about the jews again at length and not in very praiseworthy terms but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again highlights their schemes and plots against Islam and the Muslims and Allah refers to certain incidents that took place in Medina incidents such as how after the battle of Badr in the second year of Hijrah when the mushrikeen were so ignominiously defeated at the hands of the Muslims and they were humiliated the Jews became more bold in their enmity towards Muslims and they felt that Islam and the Muslims posed a greater threat than, the, than they had ever imagined so they were instrumental in inciting the Arab tribes and especially the Quraysh against the Muslims and encouraging them to take revenge for their dead in the battle of Badr and to launch an attack on Medina as a result of this incitement and also their own desire for revenge the Quraysh finally made plans to march against the Muslims in the third year of Hijrah almost a year later and this is when the battle of Uhud took place so Allah refers to the schemes and plots of the Yahud Allah also refers to some of their statements such as their blasphemous remarks regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala such as their comment that we are rich and Allah is poor another incident which is referred to in the surah again the yahud were responsible is that the yahud once made a very mischievous plan to announce islam in large numbers in the morning the plan was that since we the yahud are respected by the arabs respected by the pagan arabs because of our history of literature our history of religion and scriptures and because they consider us to be a rather educated people with a religious history what we will they looked up to them so they said what we will do is that one day in a very large group we shall all announce that we have embraced the religion of islam and what this will achieve is that the muslims will become overjoyed and the pagan arabs will also feel that since the yahud are a literate people with a history of divine revelations and scriptures they are in a better position to know and to judge the religion of islam and so if they have embraced and there must be some truth to it and it may be wise for us to follow in their footsteps obviously this was for the benefit of the wavering people and then the yahud decided that we will do this in the morning and in the evening on mass again in the same large group we shall declare our apostasy and we will say that we are tired of this religion and we find no truth in it and we will renounce the faith so what this will do is that as happy as muslims would have become in the morning now they will become even more despairing and despondent and they will be confused and their morale will be destroyed and those waverers those doubtful people who would have embraced by watching and following others they will also be convinced that there is no truth to this religion if such a uh, such a literate and educated and religious people as the jews embrace religion in such large numbers and then abandon it so obviously this would have its uh, extreme negative impact if people are embracing and leaving in large numbers so this was the actual plan from the very outset allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights that in some verses also 
Apart from that, other incidents are also mentioned. And Allah also speaks about the nature of the Yahud regarding wealth, regarding borrowing, lending, and other things. Allah also addresses the Christians, but in a very different way. And this is where the surah takes its name from. Al Imran, meaning the family of Imran. In, towards the end of the Prophet وسلم, stay in Medina, he was visited by Christians from Najran, which was a place in southern Arabia, part of modern day Yemen. There, there was a very large Arab Christian community, known as the Christians of Najran. And they traveled to Medina in order to speak to the Prophet ﷺ and discuss their Christian religion with him and also to listen to this new revelation, the Holy Qur'an. So when they came to Medina, <coughs> initially a few debates took place, debates in the sense that a few discussions took place with the Prophet ﷺ uh, and the Sahaba عنهم, about uh, Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, his mother Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam, about Christianity and Islam, about belief in the oneness of Allah and in Trinity, etc. During that time, Allah revealed a number of verses of Surah Ali Imran, speaking about the family of Sayyidina Imran alayhi salatu wasalam. And the story, as Allah mentions, is Sayyidina Imran alayhi salatu wasalam, his wife prayed to Allah and vowed to Allah that the child that was in her stomach she would devote that child to the service of the Masjid of Allah, Masjid Al-Aqsa, etc. And that child would remain in the Masjid for the rest of its life, serving Allah and serving Allah's religion. When the child was born, instead of a boy as they had hoped, it, tur- it turned out to be a girl. So she exclaimed in surprise that, oh Allah, it's a girl. Even though I prayed for a boy and I vowed that if it's a boy, this is what I would do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied that this, this girl is unlike, is quite unlike any other boy. Upon Allah's instruction, the child was named Maryam. And the vow remained intact. And Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam began worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and was devoted to the service of the masjid in her own private chamber. Her, one of her relatives, Zakariya alayhi salatu wasalam, was also a prophet. He was given the responsibility to look after her and he would visit her and see the miraculous nature of her worship and the food that she would receive, etc. And then finally, she conceived miraculously and Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam was born and even before his birth, the angels gave the glad tidings to Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam and explained to her what her child would become. And then Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam spent a life of miracles and worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then finally, when his time came, he was called to Allah. So Allah mentions all of these things. So this is a kind of short history of the family of Imran. Sayyidina Imran alayhi salatu wasalam was the grandfather of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, Allah mentions all of these details about that family to point out to the Christians, not only those who came to visit the Prophet but for all time, that there was, although the birth of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu was miraculous, and although he held a great position in the sight of Allah, and so did his mother and that whole family, in all of that, notwithstanding all of this, there is nothing to warrant them the position of God, Son of God, or Mother of God, or One of the Trinity. And ultimately they are all servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah mentions that just as Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu was born miraculously, similarly, the Yahya alayhi salatu was also born miraculously, whom most people refer to as John the Baptist. Sayyidina Yahya alayhi salatu wasalam. Sayyidina Zakariya alayhi salatu wasalam, when he would visit Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam and see fruits out of season in her chamber knowing that nobody else had access to her and that he hadn't brought them he would ask her where do you get these fruits from and she would say from Allah they come miraculously and Allah feeds whom he wills and sustains without any reckoning or account so when he saw this miracle he, he was moved to pray to Allah that oh Allah although I have become old and my wife is also barren and she has become old still we pray to you that grant us a child 
miraculously, just like you feed Maryam alayhi salatu salam miraculously. So the angels gave him and his wife the glad tidings that despite their old age and despite her infertility, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would bless them with a child in extreme old age. And that child was to be named Yahya from Allah. And it was a name that had never been given to any child before. So just as Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu salam's birth was miraculous in that it occurred without a father, Similarly, the birth of Yahya alayhi salatu was also miraculous in that it took place in extreme old age despite the apparent barren nature and infertility of both father and mother. And even more miraculous than that is the birth of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu who was born without father and mother. Yet, none of these miraculous births warranted them the title of God or the son of God. So what was so special about Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, that he should be given the title, the son of God? So these verses are addressed to the Christians, not only those who came to visit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi but for all time. After speaking about the people of the book in many different ways, the surah then moves on to discuss the second main topic, which is the battle of Uhud. This took place in the third year of Hijrah, and... I've mentioned this before in some detail, and I won't be able to go over the details now, but in the third year of Hijrah, the Mushrikeen came from Mecca to launch an attack on Medina. Prophet ﷺ consulted the Sahaba, and then after, consultation, after some consultation, they all agreed, well, the Prophet ﷺ finally decided to face the Mushrikeen outside the city rather than from within the city. So the Prophet ﷺ marched towards the mountain of Uhud which is at some miles distance from Medina and there under the mountain the Prophet ﷺ planned to fight the Mushrikeen in the plain, on the plain of Uhud so w- one morning the Prophet ﷺ marched out with the Sahaba عنهم, the hypocrites also joined them with the explicit intention amongst themselves of abandoning the Muslims right at the last minute and returning to Medina so initially the numbers would have appeared to be swollen and great but then the mushrikeen would decimate those numbers in the hundreds by returning uh, quickly to Medina just when the Muslims needed them the most. So that happened. Then the Prophet ﷺ stood with the Sahaba عنهم, and fought against the mushrikeen. The details of the battle are very long and I won't be able to go over them, but just one or two main points. One thing that's of great importance in the Battle of Uhud, which was a turning point in the battle, is that the Prophet wasallam surveyed the battlefield uh, under the, the plain of Uhud, under the mountain. And he, as part of his strategy, noticed that there was a particular ravine on one part of the battlefield. And this was a very deep trench, a kind of ravine. And there was a great danger that the enemy would secretly come up to them from behind and catch the Muslims in a pincer attack. So the Prophet ﷺ, in order to thwart such an attack from that valley and ravine, the Prophet ﷺ appointed 50 archers on a certain hilltop that overlooked the ravine. And this was a main turning point. So those archers, if they guarded the hilltop, they were able to watch over the ravine. And if any enemy troops did come from that side, they would be able to ward them off with their arrows. So the Prophet ﷺ selected 50 archers and he appointed an Amir, a leader over them, and instructed them to climb the hilltop and to guard that hilltop and ensure that no troops, came, no enemy troops came from that side and caught the Muslims from behind unaware. So the Prophet ﷺ instructed them that no matter what happens, whether the battle continues or ends, whether we suffer a defeat or whether we win, under no circumstances are the Muslim, are those 50 archers to descend from that hilltop. They were dispatched and they took up their position. The battle began. And initially, even though the Muslims numbered only approximately 700, because initially the force was 1,000, 300 hypocrites returned to Medina. The Muslims were left with only 700 soldiers. The Quraysh had more than 3,000 soldiers in their army. So more than thrice the number. The battle, despite the overwhelming odds stacked against them, despite the overwhelming number, the Muslims still scored a decisive victory in the beginning. 
And within a short while, the, many of the mushrikeen suffered losses and they began fleeing and dispersing from the battlefield. As they were fleeing, the, they fled and they were scattering on all sides, they were scattered on all sides and they were dispersed and they began fleeing and retreating. The Muslims were overjoyed and they immediately began to collect the spoils of the battle, spoils of the war, the booty, the spears, the weapons, the shields, the blankets and other goods and valuable items left behind by the fleeing mushrikeen. Now as the Muslims began focusing their attention on gathering the spoils of war and the wealth left behind by the mushrikeen, the 50 archers, many of them saw that the battle had ended and they were on a high position. So they turned round to their Amir and said, look, the battle has ended and the Muslims are gathering the wealth of Ghanima. So let us also descend and join in and let us also claim our share of the spoils of war. The Amir, along with one or two of his companions, insisted that no, we must abide by the Prophet ﷺ's instructions to the letter. And we cannot move from this place until he alone himself explicitly grants us permission to do so. But this discussion took place and ultimately the most of that group of 50 decided that no, the Prophet ﷺ's instructions were only for the duration of the battle. They descended and they began uh, claiming and collecting the spoils of war themselves. And only the Amir, the leader, with a handful of archers was left on the hilltop. Now Khalid ibn al-Walid, the famous general of Islam whom the Prophet ﷺ described as the drawn sword of Allah in later years, in the battle of Uhud he has still not become a Muslim and he was a brilliant strategist and he had been waiting with a cavalry of 200 strong 200 strong cavalry at a distance he had not taken part in the battle in the initial battle and he was specifically waiting for this hilltop to be vacated so that he could charge down this valley from behind the Muslims and surprise them with this 200 strong force of cavalry so he waited for that opportunity and when he saw those 50 archers descending and only a handful of them left he seized the opportunity and he came racing down with those 200 horsemen. And at the same time, he sent word to the fleeing and retreating mushrikeen to come back. They came back and gathered in numbers. Khalid bin Walid um, uh, launched an attack from behind and the Muslims were caught from both sides in a pincer attack whilst they were completely engrossed in gathering the wealth of booty. So, inna lillah. There was utter confusion. More than 70 Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum were martyred. 70 or more Sahaba radiallahu anhum were martyred, including some of the most famous Sahaba, such as Sayyidina Musa ibn Umayr and Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Many more were injured. In fact, in that confusion, the Muslims were caught from both sides. In that confusion, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum began fleeing on all sides. They themselves scattered and dispersed. The Prophet sallallahu was on one occasion left alone with just two, three people guarding him. And he himself began retreating towards a mountain, so did many of the Sahaba on all four sides. And in that confusion, a rumor spread that the Prophet sallallahu himself had been martyred. And although he hadn't been martyred, the Kuffar, realizing the opportunity, they were launching concerted attacks at the Prophet sallallahu himself. And one kafir khabith, he saw his opportunity and he came charging towards Rasulullah وسلم, and he managed to get through to the Holy Prophet وسلم, and he struck a very severe blow with his heavy sword but luckily the sword hit the helmet of Rasulullah وسلم, and not any other part of his body but when it hit the helmet it fell with such force that the helmet and the sides and the rings of the helmet dug into the cheeks of Rasulullah two of his teeth dropped out he began bleeding from his mouth as well as from the side of his face sides of his face where the rings had dug in the prophet sallallahu in that state he retreated and there was utter confusion eventually the muslims managed to regain some control and once again the mushrikeen began to be beaten back and eventually the two armies separated but although the battle ended undecisively Initially the Muslims had scored a victory, but then they, were, they suffered this great setback. And the, the Mushrikeen thought they had scored a victory, even though they hadn't annihilated the Muslims that they had planned to do so. And the Muslims were also in shock 
that after the initial victory they had suffered this great setback. So in this way the two armies separated, there was an exchange of insults and promises to meet again, and then uh, the Muslims returned to Medina, the Quraysh, began making their return journey to Mecca. After the return journey, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed many verses of Surah Ali Imran, highlighting some of the events of the battle as well as the mistakes that the Muslims had made. Especially that one turning point, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of that, that فَأَثَابَكُمْ إِذْ تُسْعِدُونَ وَلَا تَلْغُونَ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ وَالرَّسُولُ يَدْعُوكُمْ فِي أُخْرَاكُمْ فَأَثَابَكُمْ غَمَّ بِغَمِّ لِكَيْ لَا تَحْزَنُوا عَلَىٰ مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَىٰ مَا أَصَابَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ خَبِيرُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah Azza wa Jalla says, remember, Allah paints the scene again for the believers that remember when you were climbing up the mountain and when you were not turning around towards anyone and the messenger of Allah was calling out to you from behind you but nobody was listening. Everybody was worried and concerned about himself and there was confusion. Many of them could not hear the uh, shouts of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَأَثَابَكُمْ غَمَّ بِغَمْ Allah Azza wa Jal inflicted a suffering upon you in you of a suffering. And what that verse means is that you disobeyed the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And by disobeying him and ignoring his commands, you hurt the Prophet of Allah Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. So because of the hurt of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah inflicted pain and suffering upon you. And because of one failure to obey the command of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and to hurt him in that one way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inflicted such a great setback and almost complete defeat upon the Muslims. And this is highlighted by another verse of the Qur'an in which Allah azza wa jal says, Let those who disobey the command of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fear that a calamity may befall them or a painful punishment may reach them. So, and there are other lessons as well that have been drawn from the Battle of Uhud. And then after the Battle of Uhud, something else happened is that the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum returned to Medina wounded, sick, weak, exhausted. Yet straight away, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa invited them to march with him again in the direction of Mecca in order to pursue the retreating mushrikeen. So he called out to them and said that who will march with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam although everybody is tired, wounded, many of you are injured and many of you have lost your beloved ones. This was straight after the battle. You are under no obligation to come. Still, all of the sahaba radiyallahu anhum who had participated in the battle of Uhud straight away said, Ya Rasulullah, we are with Allah and his Rasul. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And they march with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Towards Makkah al-Mukarramah And even though no battle took place Sahaba radiyallahu anhum were able to rest At a certain spot Where they had hoped to meet the kuffar They rested, recuperated And they even traded with a passing caravan Realized great profits And then returned to Medina Safe and sound and healthy But Allah Azza wa Jalla praises them for having answered the call of Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam despite being so weak and so wounded and injured. So in this way Allah has really speaks about the battle of Uhud in many different ways. Like I said there are so many different aspects to it but we don't have time. And then towards the end Allah again returns to the topic of the people of the book. Also apart from the people of the book and the praise of the Muslims there's one section of the surah devoted to the hypocrites and their evil nature and how they sought to abandon the Muslims and inflict harm, inflict harm and pain upon them. And Allah Azza wa Jalla speaks about the hypocrites at some length. And then towards the end, Allah returns to the topic of the people of the book. And then with some general verses, and with the final verse, reminding the believers to be patient, and to be wary, and to be steadfast, and to guard themselves in the way of Allah. Allah Azza wa Jalla ends the surah with that particular verse. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to understand and act upon these verses of the Qur'an. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasooli nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhanakallahum bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha ila anta nastaghfiru wa antu wa ilayk. This lecture was given by Shaykh Abu Yusuf Riyadhul Haq and has been presented to you by Al Kothar Productions. For further information, additional lectures and books, contact us on 0121-773-5191 or alternatively by post at Al Kothar Productions, P.O. Box 6008, Birmingham, 
B10 0 UW United Kingdom or visit our website at www.alkotheracademy.org Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh